Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line one income. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement, but just an outline. Other forms and schedules flowing into these line items. One of those, the Schedule E, in essence an income statement in and of itself. Rental income minus rental expenses. The net rental income flowing into line one income of the income tax formula. With rental real estate income, as with business income, we typically want to keep it separate from our personal activities, which helps us with our bookkeeping. It helps us with our planning and budgeting into the future. And of course, it helps us with our tax preparation. So in prior presentations, we've been focusing in on scenarios where we have a separate piece of property used 100% as a rental property. Now, the concepts that we looked at in that type of scenario will typically apply even when things get a little bit more convoluted. And then we've got to deal with the convolutedness, such as situations where we have a personal use component. For example, if we use a property for rental property for part of the year, and then we actually use it for personal use for part of the year, like a vacation home kind of situation. Or if we have a situation where we live in a unit or live in a place but we rent part of it out now we have to be parsing out between business and personal we also could have situations where we have like common areas that we'll talk about okay so first let's take a look at the condominiums so a condominium is most often a dwelling unit in a multi-unit building but can also take uh take other forms such as townhouse or garden apartment so now you've got this unit that's in a building. You own it, you're not renting the unit, but you own uh, the unit in the building. So if you own a condominium, you also own a share of the common elements such as land, lobbies, elevator, and service areas. So obviously, if you think about a building, you own a nice place in the condominium, but you have to get up there to, 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 to get to the place. You've got the elevator, you've got all the common areas uh, related to the condominium. Those are those are owned in part by the owners of the condominium. So now you've got this kind of community kind of situation that that is owning, you know, these common areas. And then, of course, you own the unit exclusively. So you and the other condominium owners may pay dues or assessments to a special corporation that is organized to take care of the common elements. So now you've got this little political unit that's designed for the purpose of taking care of those common <clears throat> areas which everybody of course disagrees on how to do <laughs> but in any case special rules apply if you rent your condominium to others so you can deduct as rental expenses all the expenses discussed in chapter one and two in addition you can deduct any dues or assessments paid for maintenance of the common elements which kind of makes sense right if you have the condominium you rent out the condominium well, now you've got the expenses related to the condominium that are that are similar to other kinds of rental property, but you also have these dues that are being paid, which are basically required for the condominium. So you would think you'd be able to deduct them as uh, rental expenses. You can't deduct special assessments you pay to a condominium management corporation for improvements. However, uh, you may be able to recover your share of the cost of any improvement by taking depreciation. Corporatives. If you live in a corporative, you don't own your apartment. Instead, a corporation owns the apartments and you are a tenant stockholder in the corporative housing corporation. So it's a different structure of ownership, which could have some benefits, but has some complexities attached to it as well. Clearly, it's a similar structure as we see in the business world with a corporation. So we can compare like a partnership, for example, to a corporation. If you have a partnership in a normal business setting, the partners own the partnership directly. Their percentage ownership is determined by their capital accounts and the partnership agreement. When we move to a corporation, we think of the corporation as a separate legal entity, which could lend some liability protection to the owners, the shareholders of the corporation, which is one reason to go to a corporation oftentimes in a normal kind of uh, business settings. And then the ownership of the corporation is going to be broken out into fixed units of shares, which make the shares easier to kind of uh, transfer oftentimes. And then someone's ownership in the corporation will be dependent on the number of shares that are owned in it. 
So you have a similar kind of structure here instead of valuing you know, your particular unit or owning your particular unit and then having joint ownership of some kind to the common uh, areas. You would think you could imagine the whole thing as basically one corporation kind of situation and your ownership uh, will be reflected by the number of uh, tenant stockholders. So once again, if you live in a cooperative, you don't own your apartment directly. Instead, a corporation owns the apartments, corporations being a separate legal entity, but it's just an entity. And obviously <clears throat> you own part of the entity and you are a tenant stockholder in the corporate in the corporative housing uh, corporation. So you own stocks that's going to be reflecting your value in the in the in the corporation. OK, so if you rent your apartment to others, you can usually deduct as a rental expense all the maintenance fees you pay to the corporate housing corporation. In addition to the maintenance fees paid to the corporate housing corporation, you can deduct your direct payments for repairs, upkeep and other rental expenses, including interest paid on a loan used by your stock in the corporation. All right, depreciation. You will be depreciating your stock in the corporation rather than apartment itself. This is where it gets kind of kind of messy here. It gets a little bit confusing because now you have the, the stocks that are representing, which are in a corporation, which are representing your property. So, so you want to be able to get the depreciation clearly uh, as an expense. So you will be depreciating your stock and the corporation rather than the apartment itself. Figure your depreciation deduction as follows. One, figure the depreciation for all the depreciable real property owned by the corporation. So we're going to think about it as a full unit first and then kind of think about our share of the depreciation, right? That would based on our, our the amount of ownership that we have. Okay, so depreciation methods are discussed in chapter two. So that would the corporative would be doing their depreciation thing. If you bought your corporative stock after its first offering, figure the depreciation base basis of this property as follows. A, multiply your cost per share by the total number of outstanding shares. B, add to the amount figured in A, any mortgage debt on the property on the, uh, on the date you bought the stock. C, subtract uh, from the amount figured in B, any mortgage debt that isn't for depreciable real property, such as the part for the land, because we can only depreciate the building. Two, subtract from the amount figured in one, any depreciation for space owned by the corporation that can be rented, but can't be lived in by tenant stockholders. Three, <clears throat> divide the number of uh, your shares of stock by the total number of shares outstanding, including any shares held by the corporation. So now we're to, this is the ratio that we have now, right? Because it's our number of shares compared to the total number of shares out there. That's kind of our percent ownership, you would think, right? So four, multiply the result of two by the percent you figured in three. This is your depreciation of the stock. Okay, your depreciation deduction for the year can't be more than the part of your adjusted basis defined in chapter two. So uh, in the stock and your corporation that is applicable to your rental property. Payments added to capital account. Payments earmarked for a capital asset or improvement or other, otherwise charged to the corporation's capital account are added to the basis of your stock in the corporation. For example, you can't deduct a payment used to pave a community parking lot, install a new roof, or pay the principal of the corporation's mortgage. Treat as a capital cost the amount you were assessed for capital items. This can't be more than the amount by which your payments to the corporate, uh, corporation exceeded your share of the corporation's mortgage interest and real estate taxes. So you can see where kind of the complexity comes into play because now you have to parse out the the depreciation. You have to kind of figure what that's going to be. And then if there's improvements, if you're paying for improvements in the building, those again would usually be capitalized items that you would you would need to depreciate instead of expensing at the point in time that they happen.